Hello, SLIS 701. Before I begin this segment, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the endurance of many of you that have been challenged by the devastating floods that took place on Sunday in South Carolina, as well as those of you affected by the massive storm complex that impacted the entire East Coast over the past weekend. Some of you may have experienced damage, loss, have had to relocate or experiencing incredible stress in the aftermath of the storm. Please know that my thoughts are with you during the cleanup efforts and as you recover. As humans, we all react to people and circumstances that are different from our own lived experience. This is one of many reasons why it is important to have constructive discussions about social and cultural difference in society at large, as well as in the library information science domain. Dr. Copeland introduced the concept of lived experience and the need for the incorporation of divergent perspectives and experiences in library and information science research, education, programming, and the provision of services. I'd like to add my voice to this module on equity of access by segueing into a discussion on socio-cultural factors that can challenge or limit equity of access, the importance of cultural competence in library information science, as well as review tools and strategies for achieving intercultural communication. I'll start by reviewing some definitions and concepts central to this discussion beginning with an exploration of the concept of lived experience. The term comes from the discipline of phenomenology and the philosophical study of consciousness and the acquiring of knowledge through direct, first-hand experiences. Allard, Mayra, and Kayyem encourage librarians to draw from their lived experience by developing an awareness of their own cultural experience as a means to begin to understand and respect the cultural experiences of other people. They also advise that by doing so, it could promote recognition of the underlying power imbalances embedded in people's daily living. The concept of lived experience was expanded upon further in Campbell's missive on ableism, which I'll discuss next, in which the author introduced and defined the concepts of individualized and communal aspects of lived experience. Individualized lived experience being personal experiences and communal lived experience resulting from legacies of experience which pervade both the conscious and unconscious realms. Vera Schwinnard professor of geography and critical scholar on the geographies of disability, and Fiona Kumari Campbell, professor of disability studies, have defined ableism and disableism. Schwinnard defined ableism as ideas, practices, institutions, and social relations that presume able-bodiedness and by so doing construct persons with disabilities, adding that this set of social relations and practices gives rise to environments that exclude and marginalize persons with disabling differences. Schoenard goes on to state that an ableist society is then one that tends to devalue its non-able body members. Campbell defined this as disableism, a set of assumptions and practices promoting the differential or unequal treatment of people because of actual or presumed disabilities. Schwinnard also introduced the concept of ableist geographies, lived environments which incorporate and perpetuate physical and social barriers to the participation of disabled persons in everyday life. noting that for differently able people, ableist geographies physically create barriers to inclusion in social institutions, in addition to social exclusion that can result from reactions to differently able people that challenge their right to be and in particular 
to be in able-bodied spaces. Dr. Copeland's discussion of the relationship between social constructionism, accessibility for differently able library members, and the capacity for libraries to be equalizers of knowledge provides a springboard to my extension of the idea of equity of access to information and knowledge to cultural identity and collective memory. There are a plethora of terms central to the idea of equity of access to information, knowledge, and heritage assets as it relates to cultural, social, and economic differences in library member communities. James M. Jones, director of the Center for the Study of Diversity at the University of Delaware, referred to diversity as more than demographic differences. He defined diversity as differences by virtue of country of origin, culture, sexual orientation, age, values, political affiliation, socioeconomic status, able-bodiedness, and psychological tendencies, abilities, or preferences. Patricia Montil Overall Associate Professor at the School of Information Resources and Library Science at the University of Virginia defined equity of access as equality and opportunities for diverse groups to access information in library collections, resources, and instruction. I introduced these terms as place markers to highlight Dr. Copeland's consideration of the contradiction between libraries as equalizers of knowledge and the challenges of accessibility for a differently abled student navigating a library or classroom. I juxtapose these reference points with the following concepts that belie the idea of inclusion in society at large as well as the library information science domain. Patricia Lee, professor in charge of the George Washington Carver Academy at Iowa State University and scholar on technology equity, defined analog divide as centuries-old non-computer and telecommunications-based educational inequities resulting in unequal access to resources or opportunities. She also defined digital divide as inequalities in access to information technologies that exist among racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Psychologist Gordon Allport developed the Allport Scale of Prejudice in 1954 to measure the manifestation of prejudice in society. He defined ethnic prejudice as an antipathy based upon a faulty and inflexible generalization felt or expressed and directed toward a group as a whole or toward an individual because they are a member of that group. Perceptions of race, like physical ability, are a result of social construction. Sociologist Michael Omi and Howard Winnett defined race as a socio-historical concept part of a phenomenon of classifying people on the basis of real or imagined attributes that vary across time and place. Eduardo Bonilla Silva, professor and chair of sociology at Duke University, identified the process of racialization as social constructs, processes, and systems in which economic, political, social, and ideological levels are structured by placing people in racial categories or races. As a side note, Dr. Bonilla Silva is scheduled to speak this evening at the Chapman Cultural Center Theater at USC Upstate. I don't know if the event is still going on as scheduled due to conditions in the aftermath of the floods, but if it is and you're interested, contact Dr. Esther Godfrey at the Center of Women's and Gender Studies in Spartanburg at 864-503-5602 or send an email to egodfrey at uscupstate.edu for more information.
Jones defined racism as a process of creating advantage or disadvantage groups through the coordinated action of individual level biases with institutional and cultural level biases. Gretchen Jenneret, Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Educational Leadership and Social Justice Center at Duquesne University, has delineated three levels of marginalization which include intentional and unintentional actions. The first level consists of individual acts of prejudice, ignorance, and hatred. The second level, institutional policy, practice, and norms, and the third, cultural assumptions, norms, and practices. I'd now like to unpack the concepts of context and cross-cultural communication before moving on to discuss the results and recommendations from a cultural competence survey of LIS students conducted by Kumasi and Hill. Allard, Mayra, and Kayyem applied the theoretical lenses of social psychologist Gert Hofstadter's cross-cultural communication and anthropologist Edward T. Hall's concepts of high and low context messaging to present a framework for intercultural librarianship which provides effective information service to diverse library communities. Upon the conclusion of a symposium with LIS graduate students, Allard, Mayra, and Kayyem introduced an intercultural toolkit which defined the abilities necessary for effective intercultural communication in order to provide information to diverse cultures of library members. The toolkit consists of the ability to identify cultural dimension, identify cultural communication style, recognize who and what might be marginalized, recognize mechanisms for organizing and supplying information, and recognizing who built the information technology being used. I can only highlight two salient features of the intercultural toolkit in the interest of time, cultural dimension and context messaging. Cultural dimension looks at culture from the perspective of individualistic and collective cultures. Individualistic cultures are characterized by individual achievement, personal competition, facts about the world are separated from human meaning, and individuals receive credit or blame for success or failure. Collective cultures value the achievement of groups larger than the family unit. Group members share responsibility and accountability. The physical world is viewed in context with human meaning and credit or blame for success or failure is placed on the group rather than individual members. Context messaging refers to the communication style used within a particular culture. Low context messaging relies heavily upon words to convey information. The words contained within a message are direct and highly structured. High context messaging relies on more than words to impart information. Information is conveyed through the context of the message using inflection, nonverbal cues, and culturally specific mannerisms. Fiona Blackburn an indigenous library practitioner and scholar of cultural competence and community engagement defined cultural competence as the ability to understand the needs and norms of populations different from one's own in order to negotiate differences between a group's norms and the provision of library service. Overall describe the skill set of a culturally competent librarian as an ability rather than behavior developed over time demonstrating knowledge understanding and respect for diverse cultural backgrounds and characteristics through interactions with individuals from diverse linguistic 
cultural and socio-economic groups and full integration of the culture of diverse groups into services, work, and institutions in order to enhance the lives of both those being served by the library profession and those engaged in service. In 2010, Kumasi and Hill initiated the first in a series of studies on cultural competence in library and information science. Conducting a survey of two groups of students, the first group enrolled in an ALA accredited SLIS program and the second at an ALA accredited I school. The purpose of the survey was to assess the extent to which LIS students felt their programs prepared them to effectively serve library patrons from a variety of educational, cultural, social, and ethnic backgrounds. The results of the study indicated that the students felt their coursework and class interactions did not help them to learn how to adequately provide services to diverse communities. Kumasi and Hill recommended initiation of dialogue, strategic planning, and curricula alignment presenting concepts related to the sociocultural aspects of literacy, knowledge of the cultural differences among ethnic populations in the United States, recognition of the barriers to information access and use that may exist for individuals from various ethnic groups, and the role libraries play in providing outreach and services to these communities. As the ethnic composition of the United States trends towards segments of the population that have been historically marginalized or systematically racialized, the significance of implementing and delivering culturally competent library information services and programming is essential to ensuring equity of access. Cultural competence like information and digital literacy are key components to achieving this objective. Information and culture professionals provide services which document and preserve the knowledge and heritage assets of the communities they service. As information and cultural workers, librarians, archivists, and museum curators provide access, impart value, and distribute information and culture products which steward the identity and collective memory of an intercultural society. As library, archive, and museum professionals, you will have the responsibility of acting as gatekeepers and stewards to the cultural products and heritage assets of the member communities you will be in partnership with. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you all are safe and well. Hello SLIS 701. Before I begin this segment, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the endurance of many of you that have been challenged by the devastating floods that took place on Sunday in South Carolina, as well as those of you affected by the massive storm complex that I voice to this module on equity of access by segueing into a discussion on socio-cultural factors that can challenge or limit equity of access the importance of cultural competence in library information science, as well as review tools and strategies for achieving intercultural communication in the library information science domain. Dr. Copeland introduced the concept of lived experience and the need for the incorporation of divergent perspectives and experiences in library and information science research, education, programming, and the provision of services. I'd like to add my impact the entire East Coast over the past weekend. Some of you may have experienced damage, loss, have had to relocate, or experiencing incredible stress in the aftermath of the storm. Please know that my thoughts are with you during the cleanup efforts and as you recover. As humans, we all react to people and circumstances that are different from our own lived experience. This is one of many reasons why it is important to have constructive discussions about social 
and cultural difference in society at large, as well as 